are some people buy land to put a mobile home on. You know, there's um, in land to put mobile homes on is becoming more and more scarce. So that they're actually the value of those are going up. We see it, it varies greatly across the country. You know, something in Arizona that has water is worth a whole lot more than something in Arkansas. The water rights can be worth 75000 just to have water to a lot that you can put a mobile home on. But, um, you know, some, some people buy it to put a second home on, and some are agricultural. Um, you know, there's lots of different uses, but the, I would say the most common is someone who's buying a piece of land to, um, to build a house on or to set a mobile home later, you know, unless you're talking about commercial. There we go. Well, Dave puts from JKB Holdings, start two. Alongside me is Nathan Turner. Thank you for those Thank who are you. tuning in, letting me know no sound. I think you should appreciate that. We're having a little issue with Facebook, so we're uh, fixing that right now. So, we're going to rewind a little bit, a little technical, a little late start, but we have some big things that are going on. And first and foremost, we're just talking about DME without yeah. sound. So, tell yeah. us about what you're doing. You're posting, like you just said, which is shocking. So, yeah, What's going on? It, it, it's awesome. Well, I'm uh, so I'm in Utah right now, visiting some family and things. Uh, ticket sales are off and running. I'm posting stuff on Facebook and LinkedIn, which is probably the biggest miracle of them all. Yeah, uh, hopefully you've seen the posts. Hopefully you're sharing those posts and just spreading the word. We want to get as many people there as possible. And the more people, the more benefit everybody gets. Uh, talking to some, I was at a Rio last night, talking to a bunch of people that are doing creative financing and seller financing. And so I said, you guys just keep doing what you're doing. I'll cash you out. Let's do this over and over again. And uh, they love that idea. So hopefully they'll join us as well. We want to stress those who are note investors. I agree. I'd love to see you guys, but we want to see other people. And what Nathan is doing is I, we shared last time is tremendous, right? We're really bringing together these seller finance, owner finance group of people who know nothing yeah. about us, bringing them to us and saying, Hey, listen, We'll buy your stuff. And each people are to come here with the idea of, I want someone to buy my notes from me. Yeah. Handshake situation. So. Oh yeah. We can do a tremendous amount tickets. of business together. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So get there. Get your tickets, get your stuff together. And if you're owner financing, make sure you have your collateral file together. Make sure you have your mortgage, your note, anything yeah. together, your title policy, um, your pay history, everything ready because the people who will be buying your notes are going to be in attendance as well. Yeah. And if you don't know what any of that means, go back and watch our podcast from a couple of weeks ago Yeah, and uh, and get some education on what it is you need to, to be able to sell your note and then just come. And if you're missing some stuff, we'll let you know. We'll yeah. tell you what we need to make that whole so we can buy that note from you. So it's awesome to see, you know, this whole conversation um, of notes have been good. Uh, we also want to stress the fact that we'll be um, restarting up our five week training course as well coming up yeah. weeks from now. Um, that's for those people who are looking to get to the next level of note investing. Um, if you want to understand what a big calculator is from the performing side of it, that's key. But also from the non-performing, we teach you and we build out a non-performing bid calculator in the course from state-specific situations and all the key things that go on so you can have your own calculator built to where you want it with everything that you care about. So definitely and, and that becomes that. extra yeah and that becomes extra important when we're talking about some seller finance notes because they've got some terms that you might not normally see in an institutional note they might throw in something about interest only or, or you know a balloon coming up or something like that yeah. that is not normally what we see in an institutional note uh so building out that calculator so that you can include those calculations is a big deal absolutely it's all different different things the ammunition schedule may be different they may have different numbers in it and different page structures. It's just crazy out there, but you can buy it all, right? So we yeah. want to stress that. Um, this is awesome. So one of the things we, we do in our webinar and our podcast is try to connect people with everything to do with notes, right? Our field of note investing, we thought was a small bubble of bank notes. And as we expand out, right? Not only the techniques which we talk about and strategies, but also the types of notes. We focused recently on this idea of having a land, I mean, owner finance note on properties. 
right? And that's been exploding. We've been having our Wednesday private calls and they're like, can you buy stuff? And we're working with owner finance. So if you're owner financing, please stay tuned and reach out to us because we want to teach you how to do it right so that you can easily sell any loan you create today right to us. Yeah, yeah. And there's people that will buy me included. I will buy it at the table. So if, it's like, if you've done it right, I can cash you out immediately. You can get a yep. bump and you can go do it again. Absolutely. It's a pretty good so, deal. In this DME conference, we'll be talking new investing in general, not just real estate and bank notes, right? We're going to be talking about all kinds of stuff. One of the topics that I've avoided, the kind of lack of knowledge, has been this world of what I consider to be weird notes. And I don't understand the premise of it. And I don't understand why people would do it. So what people are, right? This idea of buying notes on vacant land is that weird to you as well? Is that something you don't get? It is because, because of experience. There's one note that I bought 12 years ago, something like that, 12, 13 years ago, where I thought I was buying. It was a little bit outside of town, which I hadn't really established my, my criteria all the way yet. And so it was a little bit outside of town. Uh, like a, It seemed like a nice property on a, a bigger piece of land. And this is in Massachusetts, I want to say. And, uh, and what it ended up being was the house was absolutely unlivable. So what I, what essentially what I bought was raw land and I had no idea what to do with it. And, and because I, you know, zero experience with what to do with land, I don't know how to value that. I don't know how to, how to look at it and say, yes, that's a good thing that I bought or a bad thing that I bought. So, and I, I was completely lost. Thankfully I was able to sell it to the neighbor. Uh, the neighbor picked it up and I still made a profit on that. And so it all worked out okay, but it, it, it freaked me out because I don't know what I'm doing when it comes to land. So that was, that was one of those steps in my progression where I'm like, okay, new rule, no land. <laughs> and that was kind of that experience, but I know that it's a thing. And so I'm very interested to learn about this today. So before we <clears throat> bring in Steve for a second, I want to let everyone know I'm not sure about you, but I've got an influx of notes coming in recently. Um, the market's yeah. changing. We're seeing news reports about defaults. Um, so this idea of what we've been projecting and figuring out is starting to go fruition. Um, banks yeah. are starting to fall. Commercial loans are kind of changing, um, which we'll be getting to in a future webinar. Um, but understand the fact that inventory is changing and pricing okay. expectations is changing as well, right? Yeah. People are Already. expecting 9%, 10%. We're up to 15, 16, 17, 18. We're buying a few right now at 18 yield, which took a while to get up there, but yeah. it's there. So you're start opening your pocketbooks and get ready for your situations because it's coming. Make sure yeah. you have your bid calculators ready. You can talk about course, take it if you want, but make sure you're ready for it. So without yeah. further ado, I'm going to release Mr. Steve with luck. I appreciate Steve coming on here. And when I first got to know him, I'm amazed at someone doing anything for any length of time consistently, where it yeah. becomes second nature. Steve, thank you very much for joining us on this Friday afternoon. Hey, thank you for inviting me. Glad to be here. So, Steve, notes in general are buying a piece of paper with a security of some instrument, right? We're both right. in the same field. We're buying the same paper, your security is a little bit different from ours, right? Well, we, we buy land notes, but that's not all we buy. So um, cool. I'd say it's the same, except we may have that. If you don't buy land notes, it is a little different. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. We're very say, curious about land notes. So we're, we're glad you're here today and help educate us on what it is, what we could be looking for, or should be looking for, all that kind of thing. Okay. So Steve, I know you were probably <laughs> a young age doing this at like five years old, right? Let's be serious. How did you start? How did you get involved in this land note world? Well, I first got started. It was when I was, it was 1979. I actually uh, bought some land from a realtor and I got interested in real estate. And uh, it was actually an owner finance transaction. I, I was the 
the payer on this, not the not the purchaser of the note. I was the purchaser of the land and owner financed it. And it got me interested in real estate. So I got a real estate license and worked as an agent for about three years. And I read a book called Invest in Debt by Jimmy Napier. Some of you may have read it, but uh, it got me interested. And I uh, ended up buying a real estate note on, it was actually land, but it had a barn on it. This guy lived in the end of the barn. It was a horse barn and he had quarter horses and he really liked them. So they had a living quarters and it's probably one I wouldn't have bought if I'd have known better. But anyway, uh, it turned out well, it was a $38,000 note and uh, we bought it for 20 and it paid for like a year. And then the guy paid us off. I actually borrowed the money at the bank to purchase it. And I made the payments for a year plus the difference in what the discount was. And uh, it didn't really pay down very much. So that was more at that time than I'd made in a whole year, you know, yeah. and kind of got me hooked on notes. And uh, a lot of the notes that we purchased were land notes, you know, but also houses, but land notes are unique and, you know, any, probably be best just maybe to ask me some questions but sure further further that story um, in 1988 we decided to make the note business uh, you know we went into that that's all we did from that point forward except for purchasing real estate from time to time and uh, so that's that's kind of my you know nutshell my uh, very thumbnail sketch of my career where it started anyway so 1988, were you doing, like, were you buying bank paper or, or seller finance or, because that was a different time. Interest rates were, were quite a thing. Yeah. Back, back in those days, we were buying seller finance. We, we bought some bank notes, but mostly seller finance. And, mm-hmm. you know, during the 2008, 9, 10, we did a lot of bank notes, you know, yeah. Because that, there were all kinds of pools going around, non-performing, performing, everything yeah. and you can imagine, sub-performing. But yeah. uh, mostly throughout my uh, business life, I've done owner finance transactions and of all mm-hmm. kinds. Single family owner occupied, mobile home land, land. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've done you know, commercial, mean? just whatever. It's kind of like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. <laughs> yeah. But we have done a lot of land notes. You know, we don't. That's not necessarily what we look for, but we end up buying a lot of them. Yeah. So I can, I can answer some questions about it. You know, absolutely. Uh, we're diving into questions here. Um, just to let you guys know, we're kind of multitasking here. <clears throat> any kind of questions you ask, we're gonna we'll feed it right to them. And so please present any questions you have inside the chat. If you are doing raw land, please make sure you let us know as well, so we can um, encourage uh, and uh, you know have you kind of an expert here. It's great. So when you're buying these land notes, um, are you sent a, what we call a fee, a list of addresses, blank lots, and you're, is that the first step in it? Like, how do you find those? Yeah. We have a website that we, you know, that's pretty, you know, it's pretty active, pretty aggressive. It's not the, the top one out there, but uh, we're working on it. Uh, but we do a lot of direct mail as well. Just take you back just a little bit from the progression sure. when we first started in doing buying notes, like that note that I purchased, it was a horse barn. All we really did then was run an ad in the newspaper and you would get quite a bit, quite a few. There was not very many people buying notes then. You know, it was sure. kind of a best kept secret. Uh, <clears throat> then we, we started doing other things like direct mail. And then we started doing, actually running ads in telephone books. We were in like, a hundred mm-hmm. telephone books across the country in major cities and like a half inch to an inch will add, but it got us quite a bit of business. Mm-hmm. And then this thing called the internet came along. So we had to develop a website because phone books quit working, you know, and, and uh, the, we did some statewide classifieds, but that sort of quit working. So pretty much the internet and direct mail still is a good source for us. But uh, I think your question was, how do we find these notes? They it's, Mostly we, we do a lot of direct mail and it ends up that quite a few of the people we send to have land notes only. And so hmm. we, we don't necessarily just go looking for land notes, but they come our way and mm-hmm. you know, they're purchased differently than a single family residence because of the, the risk and the, uh, you know, sometimes the risk is less, sometimes it's more. It depends on a lot of factors. You know. So let's, I'm going to cut right to the chase. <clears throat> 
I don't get this. I know I, you answer as well on the phone with me. Why would anyone want to buy a note on a vacant land that's not built on, may not be built on for a while? Like, why would someone own a, a vacant lot and have a note for 20 years and never do anything with it? Like, that is so weird to me. Well, you know, there's all different variations of that. Most people do have a plan. You know, they plan to build on it. They plan to either build a, a second home or a home or some people buy land to put a mobile home on. You know, there's um, in land to put mobile homes on is becoming more and more scarce. So that they're actually the value of those are going up. We see it, it varies greatly across the country. You know, something in Arizona that has water is worth a whole lot more than something in Arkansas, the water rights can be worth 75,000 just to have water to a lot that you can put a mobile home on. But, um, you know, some some people buy it to put a second home on and some are agricultural. Um, you know, there's lots of different uses, but the, I would say the most common is someone who's buying a piece of land to, um, to build a house on or to set a mobile home later, you know, unless you're talking about commercial land. And are these generally like in the in an established community, or are they just kind of out in the middle of nowhere? It could be either. Um, hmm. We see a lot of land in Texas and Oklahoma that's just sort of out uh, out in the middle of nowhere. Maybe there's a lake or something nearby, hmm. or some attraction. But uh, you know, if they're one offs, sometimes it can be a a piece of land that's down a private road or or you know a, a dirt road or just a state or county road. Hmm. Um, you know, it's, there's no, it's, it's kind of like there's, there's no cookie cutter. They're all different, you know, but, but we see some of each. Some are in established subdivisions and you know, we bought one in Atlanta recently that was in an established subdivision, very nice lot. And they're getting ready to build on it and we'll get paid off probably. So you're more, the likelihood of an early payoff if you purchase at a discount, if it, if it's more established subdivision, there's probably, they're probably going to build a home. The problem, you know, we've seen recently is uh, some of the people who plan to build homes now, since rates have gone up in that or, you know, backing off and there's not, you know, it may sit there a little bit longer, mm -hmm. but uh, if the people had, you know, a lot of chips in the game, paid a pretty good down payment, got decent uh, credit, then it's still a good risk because they're not going to walk away. And that's why land, uh, mm -hmm. I mentioned, I think before we started this, it, the um, loan to value needs to be better than it does on a single family house. You know, the investment to value. You want to stay, in my opinion, depending on the quality of the property, but somewhere between 50 and 75% investment to value. If it's in a really you know, established subdivision in a very uh, uh, vibrant market, you know, uh, then you might go 75%. But that so would be a stretch. I want to make sure we're clear on some things. I've seen something in the chat. Um, I'm not going to name it by name, but someone mentioned this idea of CFDs. So land notes are different than vac notes on vacant land, right? So land contracts are different from land notes, right? So we're not discussing the idea of having a CFD contract or deed land contract per se. We're talking about more of the idea of having a note secured by vacant land. Correct. A land contract is typically, or could be on land, uh, on raw land as well, but it's it's the structure opposite of a mortgage. You have a mortgage or a land, uh, or land contract or a CFD. So we're not talking about the idea of mortgage or CFD. We're talking about the, you can have a mortgage or a CFD on, yeah. on a note secured by the promissory note being secured by a mortgage or land contract all uh, vacant land. So right. just so clarity. The collateral is what we're talking about. The collateral is land. The yes. instrument you use could be a contract for deed or land contract. Different parts of the country, they call them different. Down in the deep south, they call it a bond for title. But it's mm -hmm. still a contract for deed where you don't have title to the property until you pay it off. Right. But, you know, and we buy those just like we do mortgage and notes or in some states, it's a deed of trust and note, depending on the state. Mm -hmm. But uh, when we're talking about today, we're talking about land notes as a collateral, not the instrument used. But it could be either one or any of those three. So Help give us. us a good story. Give us a, you know, give us a home run. 
what was a situation where you got a land note, um, note secured by vacant land, and it worked out to be weird, but you didn't expect it to be? Okay, well, that first one I gave you was a pretty good one. Yeah. <laughs> the one I bought the horse barn. Yeah, you know, that was, it, was yeah. it wasn't totally vacant. It had a barn on it. Okay. But, um, you know, we, we had one recently that we purchased in uh, California that was a slow payer. Okay. But uh, anyway, they, we, we would call, make collection calls and they finally got mad and just said they were going to pay us off. And we said, please don't throw us in a briar patch, but they went in and paid us off to teach us a lesson. <laughs> so that one was, if I remember correctly, it was like a hundred thousand dollar note, which we bought for pretty, pretty sizable discount. And they paid us off at the full face amount. So, so what's we, the typical interest rate on these? Uh, they can vary. You know, we see it's, you know, so we see notes that are, you know, 2%. We see some that are 10, 11, or 12. Uh, the one thing you have to be careful is if it's very high to make sure it's not usurious or doesn't, you know, um, break some type of law or, you know, usury law yeah. or state or federal, uh, so, whatever. So that it sounds like so far, everything is pretty much the same as a regular note that we're used to with, with property attached to it. Uh, like a house on there but on a, in the case of a vacant property like a vacant land how do you how do you evaluate that how do you decide what the value is in case of you know default and you need to take it back how do you say you know it's worth x amount and we're comfortable taking on this risk we we have a kind of a I'd say a corral of realtors around the country. We find most of our realtors from a website called the REO Network. And we find, you know, they, most of the agents there are, are good. If we call, we don't like the one we first one we get, we call the next one because there's usually a list if you put a zip code in. And we, we found some really good agents and we have a list in most areas. And we use agents to go out, you know, if it's in, say, for example, South Carolina, I can't drive down there. So we use the agents as our eyes and ears and we get BPOs, you know, and um, like uh, Dave was saying earlier, sometimes you don't get a lot of information. So you have to dig deeper. You know, if it's just a parcel number, uh, some are out in the rural areas and don't even have a 911 address yet. So you have to be really diligent about trying to establish what you have. And those may get discounted more because they're, they're you know, it may be a long time before anything's done on it. You know, they may have bought it just for hunting land or, you know, hoping that uh, the future will bring something there. Some people buy, <clears throat> you know, land, owner finance it, sell the timber off and, uh, you know, end up getting enough money off the timber to pay pretty much the note off, you know. Or, uh, there's lots of uh, value that you can kind of like air rights, timber rights, mineral rights. Yeah, we're going to get into like all these due diligence steps Nathan and I posted in our chat before earlier, and we're, we're going to talk about it in a few minutes, but the due diligence steps is, I think, the biggest difference, right? Yeah. And for us, we just value a property, three, two versus a three, two bedroom in a certain distance based on population. We, we can compare it, but land seems to have a whole different spin on due diligence stuff. Um, for example, that that one that I talked about where I ended up taking, taking the, it was a piece of land. Initially we thought it was going to be worth a lot because uh, lots in the area were, were selling for quite a high amount. What we found out was there was some kind of issue and I forget exactly what it was, but there was some kind of issue that made, that made it nearly impossible to build anything on that lot. And so then that our value went from, I think we, we thought it was going to be like 75,000 and went down to about 35,000. Yeah. Uh, and so, but you know, I didn't know, I have no idea what I'm looking at. I don't know how to tell if it's buildable land or not buildable land or, or how do you, how do you find that kind of thing out? Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, one, you, you know, let me just give you a few things to watch for. One is it in a flood zone, you know, is it flood way flood zone? What, you know, you can do, you can find that out pretty easy. That's something a realtor can help you with. And you also can do that by doing uh, a flood cert, um, even to a credit bureau um, you know another thing is there any hazardous waste issues you know um, you know 
is it in a wetland? You know, there's there's things to look for like that. Um, and, you know, also is there access? You know, access is another big, is it landlocked or is there good access? Is the road all washed out? And it's a private road with a private road maintenance agreement, you know, that has to, that nobody's really maintaining, you know, or does it have an active HOA? We brought some lots in North Carolina and it had a lot of uh, HOA fees, but no one was taking care of the roads. You know, they were, the money was not being appropriated properly. But um, so access is, is a big, big one to watch for, I think. But if you, you know, with the risk, you know, maybe comes a reward. If you, uh, if you buy a lot that has, <clears throat> you know, not the greatest access, you may get a bigger discount that makes it worth the risk. You know, it's, does it, does it, it, is it an advantage if the lot is cleared? Well, it is, unless you're selling the timber, you know, but uh, normally it's, if you're going to, if someone's looking to put a home there or a, uh, a mobile home, yes, you know, it, it's definitely, uh, it's better if it's clear, not totally, you know, just clear cut, but if there's some scattered trees, but, you know, they've it's manicured and, and gotcha. brush hogged and, you know, the, the all the underbrush cut, you know, then I would say yes. You know, if you're looking for a place to hunt deer or, you know, some type of animals, then, you know, the, but it all depends on the plan, you know, the planned use of it. Now, I know we talked before about environmental, um, mm -hmm. and I made this mistake on a commercial building, and I didn't get a um, phase one. Phase one, thank you. And do you guys pull phase one on your land, vacant land, or do you not bother? I've never actually done one that I can remember, but I'm not saying that you shouldn't, particularly if you're dealing with commercial land, you know, and yeah. if there's, you know, if there's been a dry cleaners there, a gas station, a uh, mechanic shop, you know, uh, there can be issues with old tanks. There can be, there's, I can't even pronounce it, but there's a chemical that dry cleaners produce that yeah. is very toxic. And uh, you have to be careful about if there's been a dry cleaner. And yeah, then that's where you to... three owners ago was dry cleaning and the owner before us was uh was a daycare center so we didn't know anyway yes yeah. bad situation so we're working so I, I think that. sorry excuse me that's okay I, I think that's where um, a realtor can help too you know if you if you're looking at say if i'm here in arkansas and i'm looking at something in south texas and it's a commercial land and or somewhere in a potentially could be commercial and there's been buildings there before the agent will probably know that and be able to help to you know say hey this this could possibly have some environmental issues then we might need to get a phase one and even a phase two if it goes you know if the phase one shows there could potentially be something there so i think for me one of the other things that kind of scares me off is is um my concern is that if I end up taking back the property, the yeah. saleability of that is going to be difficult. Like it's going to be difficult for me to be able to resell that piece of land. Is that valid or am I just getting worried about nothing? Um, well, a lot of it depends on the market. You know, the market we were in last for a couple of years there, you could sell anything, you know, that was, you know, there, you know, that was holding yeah. the earth together. Yeah. But, um, <clears throat> It, you know, it's, it's a little harder sometimes to sell land, you know, unless if you, you usually have to offer terms, but, but not always. So it's, that's one of the concerns why you want to have a better loan to value. And if things kind of go south, like they did in 2008, then, you know, land values can really drop. You know, we, we saw some property out West that we bought for a hundred thousand and the tax value on it was 2.6 million. And wow. uh, we, we bought the land, not the notes. This yeah. was some, REOs that we bought and we ended up selling it for, we made a good profit on it but we also made money because we got the taxes reevaluated, and we got some retroactive tax money that had been paid um, oh, by doing cool. appraisals and some stuff that uh, nice. we got I think it was like 23,000 reimbursed from the state so right now what are you guys yeah. targeting for your LTVs what are your targeting what are you talking about? what LTV are you guys targeting in land notes right now uh Excuse me, sorry, man. That's okay. What kind of LTV are you guys targeting right now? Um, 
we like to stay 50 to 60 percent investment to value you know loan to value is what you know how much equity they have investment yeah. to value is how much you put in so we like to stay at you know 50 to 60 percent you know they may only have 20 percent loan to value but we can discount it to 60 or 50 percent and that's, that's why great. it's hard to determine a yield because, yield because uh, you know with land investment to value is you know trump's yield and uh, mm -hmm. sometimes uh, in order to get to the where we're comfort comfortable we have to discount it considerably more and sometimes a partial works bet you know we'll work it with that because you get your investment uh, value and it doesn't just kill the the sale you know you can sure. buy a certain number of payments and you know, after they've established a pay history with you for a year or two, then you can go back and buy some more. And I know it's will be a different, different seminar or webinar. We had a question, we had a question from Mark. Um, I'm not sure if you've bought notes on brick and mortar real estate before, but and I presume you have. But do you is the default rate on vacant land higher or lower than on traditional real estate? Kind of default rate are you think we're seeing on land versus a real estate note? Investment value? No, so what's the default rate? What kind of oh default, default rate? Um, yeah. You know, I, I really have, I don't know those statistics. Um, okay. I would say that if I was guessing that uh, it would probably be twenty percent more on land, maybe. The reason yeah. being is if a person owns a home. And uh, then they also own a piece of land somewhere that they're thinking of building a second home on or, mm -hmm. or, or if they have a piece of land and they're planning to rent. I mean, they're renting and planning to buy, build a house later. Uh, if things kind of go sideways, they're going to probably let that go before they would their home or, you know, yeah. their residence. Right. And so it's, it's usually a secondary. So I would say the risk would be, you know, 20% on a normal market. Uh, really bad in a really bad market it might be higher so I you like a moving target about, i yeah. know you mentioned before about air rights can you tell us a little bit more about what that looks like i'm not an expert on that i just know about it i've never really sold any but uh like in or around airports and stuff like that oh and, okay okay interesting and, yeah, I've never owned any land close to an airport, so I, but I know that you that people do sell those, and they, yeah, you know, it's not just airports. Also, you know, land you can sell signage and cell tower and, and lease land for that. And I know some people have done quite well doing that. I've, yeah, highways and stuff like that. That's like that's yeah. another one. Um, yeah. Interesting, you said that before uh, about the fact of you know the minerals and timber in. New Jersey, we don't have this whole minerals thing, right? For those people who are not familiar with the minerals in the land being a valuable source, can you explain a little bit more about what that looks like? What minerals are they getting and what kind of profit can you make from buying land with just minerals on it? Yeah, I've, I used to subdivide land. In, uh, we probably did a few thousand acres. It was mostly rural land that we would find. They had a, a road frontage, you know, a lot of road frontage and we'd just build uh, or do a plat and then subdivide off to the road, the county road. But uh, usually I would purchase with minerals. You know, I would buy and, st and stipulate that we were purchasing with the minerals. Then when we would sell the lots off, we would sell without the minerals. So we would keep the minerals. And mm -hmm. we actually built up about a thousand acres of, uh, of mineral rights. And I sold off, uh, you know, probably. 80% of those, but we're keeping the ones that are producing and it, they're not producing a lot. It's, but they, you know, we get a, a check for a couple of thousand a month off of those, sometimes more. And, but the different, to answer your question, the different minerals uh, can be, you know, depending on the state, you know, in Oklahoma and Texas, a lot of oil, Arkansas, even in Pennsylvania and different places, gas is a big thing, you know, natural gas, you know, that's, that's, the mineral rights that I'm receiving royalties on are on natural gas. And, uh, but uh, coal, you know, uh, mm. you know, there's other minerals out West that uh, I haven't been too involved in, but, you know, water rights are another big one. It's huge out West. Mm. We bought a piece of land in uh, Santa Clarita, California, and we sold it off and owner financed it, but we kept a little, <laughs> 
just probably a couple of acres because there's supposed to be a huge aquifer under this land. But, oh. uh, you know, for some future date, if it does, we'll have a little piece of it maybe. And can but your agent help you determine what if there's minerals in the area or what kind of study do you do to find that out? Yeah, sometimes it's, Sometimes you have to do a mineral search and title companies can do that. Uh, if you're only just buying a small track, you know, I, I would say that, you know, if, if the um, deeds within the last 30 years don't have it deeded out to minerals and they're probably there. And to do a real in-depth mineral search is extremely expensive. And on a small lot, it's not worth it. So what we do is if we buy, we just say we're purchasing with the minerals. And if we sell, we say we, we are excluding the minerals. And we usually deed those minerals off to another entity so we can we can tell the people that that uh, we don't own the minerals so we can't transfer them. Because mm -hmm. that particular entity doesn't own them, they're, they're transferred somewhere else. That's awesome. Yeah, so Very minerals can be a big, big deal if you're buying land. If you're buying the note, you really, unless you get the land back, it's not really an issue, but. right. Uh, so we had a question from right. Nathan, you said a question? Yeah, I think we maybe just answered it, but you know, how do you best learn about the mineral rights or water rights or whatever rights there might be? Is and I think you said you do that through a title company. Well, um usually the seller, if somebody's selling you something, they'll tell you, you know, if there's wow. a, some value in a water rights or you know, if there's a lot of mineral rights to go with it. If not, um you know, usually the agent might know if you're just if if the if you're purchasing it and the seller doesn't mention it, and you have a hint that there could be uh, some mineral rights there. Then you could go to a title company and have them do a search. And, uh, if, so and yeah, Robin yeah. Jackson mentioned in the comments that there's something called landmen who um, in Texas and Oklahoma who can find and yeah, there are yeah. mineral rights. That's what they do. Yeah. Yeah, I don't hear about them as much anymore. They used to be everywhere, but yeah, landmen. They yeah. call them landmen and they search for mineral rights and try to lease yeah. minerals from people and so they can drill a well. Yeah. So yeah. interesting. So that far in cool. uh, New Jersey. So, so cool though. Um, when you're working with kind of stuff, do you get the idea of what the person, so you're going to get a list of assets from whoever the seller is going to give you do you get to know what the borrower's intent is? Is that a formal letter or is that kind of a, what they think it's going to do? Or how is that presented to you? Because that's important if you want to know the borrower's intent is to build or to hunt. How do you get that information about what their intent is? Well, we first, if, if a note seller calls us wanting to sell the note, we ask them, you know, what, what, was, what are they planning to do? You know, they usually know. And before we close on that, we typically do an interview with the payer and talk to them, you know, and ask them what they're in. Well, we, we established that they agree with the balance and we have a list of, um, you know, an interview that we do questions. One of the questions is, what are you planning to do with the property? You know, are you planning on keeping it? One is first, you know, question and are you happy with it? You know, and um, so that that's, you know, kind of how we establish that. So Make sure I heard you correctly. You say you interview the borrower before you buy it. Yeah, a lot of companies do an estoppel letter, which can yeah, and estoppels can be good, but uh, I don't like them because <clears throat> we usually do the interview like a day or two before we close. If somebody's yeah. got really good credit, you send them an estoppel letter two weeks ahead of time, and uh, they say, "Oh, you're so by." They're selling my note at a discount. So they go to the payer, the seller, and <laughs> pay them out. You know, they become your best competition. So yeah. um, if we do the interview a day or two before we close, they don't really have time to do that. Hmm. And it just serves sort of the same purpose as a stop -off. So that later down the road, if the people say, hey, uh, I don't agree with the balance. So we, on such and such date at 322 p.m., we talked to you and you said you agreed with the balance. Mm -hmm. You know, and we relied upon your uh, your word at that time. So what's changed? You know, mm -hmm. sometimes. So what is the first? Lisa, ahead. what is your first step in your due diligence? Can you get a with the asset? What's the first thing you're doing? Are you Google searching it? Are you 
start pricing what you think the value of the property is? Are you reaching out to an agent? What's your first step in that process of evaluating a land note or land? Yeah. On a land note, we the first step is to establish the value of the land. You know, and we usually it if it's an established subdivision, you can get a pretty good yeah. idea through Zillow and some of the other, you can look at the tax records, which we're pretty good at looking up tax records. You know, they usually, if they just have a parcel number, we can usually find them and see what the assessed value is. That's just a rule of thumb. It's not always correct, but yeah. you get an idea. And then once we have that, um, we can make, uh, you know, an offer on the, on the note. And if they accept it, if, if the offer is not in the ballpark of what the people want to do, then we don't, we don't want to spend a lot of time on one that yeah. doesn't have much of a chance. Yeah. If they accept it, so then we, uh, we dig deeper. You know, we do our due diligence and we have an agent yeah. go look and give us a BPO. We may order a BPO through Clear Capital or one of the national companies, you know. Yeah. And uh, sounds so familiar. <laughs> we definitely <laughs> established the values there. So, yeah. Very interesting. So it's, it's, it's not as different as I thought. I, I, oh, really? I think I, yeah, I think I kind of had it built up in my head that it was a much bigger deal, but I mean, obviously there's some more homework and there's some more things you got to search out. Yeah, one, of the, one of the benefits of, of a land note is you don't have to worry about um, insurance and, and you know, a structure that <laughs> could be destroyed or a hurricane right. could hit or, you know, I mean, they might blow some trees down, but you know, that's about as bad as it would get. So yeah. you have that one less thing to think about, one less moving part. Sure. And uh, you know, if you get it back, you don't have to worry about the people destroying the house. You know, and you, I've had some real horror stories there with mm -hmm. people cutting holes in the wall, dumping fish in it, and then plastering it back. You know, and you don't find out about mm -hmm. that until about. But that happened in real estate. It happened in our world. Yeah, it's hap it happens. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the biggest fear I have is selling it right if i have to foreclose nathan uh, is my borrower he de he defaults i have to foreclose and i have to sell it my thought is who the hell buys it right what kind of time frame have you run into where what's the longest time frame it took you to if you took something back to sell that land i think in the market we're in right now um it sells pretty good you know and I, when I was a realtor, I used to tell people, uh, you know, they'd ask how much they could sell their house for, and I'd do a market analysis, and I'd say, well, mm -hmm. they'd say, what can I sell it for? And I'd have, like, three time zones or three time periods. Yeah. If you got 180 days, I can get this price. If you got, you know, 90 days, I can get you this price. In 30 days, this price. And if you want to sell it today, I'll buy it at some price, you know. Yeah, so yeah, Of course. It depends on, you know, how, if you're into it right, then you, that helps. That's why you want to be at 50 or 60% loan to value because you can go, you can ask a little bit lesser price if you get it back and okay. where it will market. And even if the market drops, you're still got a, a margin of error, some cushion there. So uh, land can tend to sell slower. Sometimes it can sell faster if people, Mobile home lots are really difficult to find these right, days. Right. So if you yeah, you're right. buy a, a note on a mobile home lot, uh, there's probably somebody standing in line wanting to buy it. You know, or you can go to dealerships and different people. And um, like um, Nathan said earlier, the next door neighbor is sometimes a good prospect. You know, yeah. it's their best prospect probably is the next door neighbor. Yeah. yeah. So Robin Jack can also ask us about uh, going to a title company. Do you go to a title company to transfer, or do you run title your own your own title? We, if it's a really small note, we'll just do a title search. We use a company, uh, uh, Pro Title. That we use a lot of times. We use a couple of others that just do title searches. They'll do a two two owner search if mm -hmm. it's a. Uh, you know, five, ten, twenty thousand dollar note. We probably are not going to buy title insurance and spend a thousand or two dollars. You know, the economy of scale is just not there. Yeah. But if it's a larger note, then we always get a, a lender's policy. If it's a contract for deed, we get an owner's policy. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. It, it just depends on the size of the note and uh, so uh, are the contractor. You know, huh. it, it is so similar. It's just a due diligence steps for us. Yeah. That's very similar. You just got to make sure that, you, you know, that uh, the collateral's there. 
and uh, that you know you have access there's no uh, major hazardous waste problems you're not in a wetland of course you do that right. if you're checking a house too you know it could be in a, sure. in a flood zone you know or yeah. could, could possibly be you have to get flood insurance um, but you know sometimes with land you know you can get it removed from the flood you know you can go to the corps of engineers and we had that happen on some land we bought where we got it removed and it was worth a lot more money that's no guarantee and it takes some work but there's potential for that very interesting so i mean you've been doing this for a little while now so i mean you've been around the block <laughs> a couple of times you've seen a couple of cycles where yeah. where do you think we are in this cycle? Like we I we've got our own opinions, but for somebody that's seen cycles come and go. Well, I saw the you know, Jimmy Carter 22% interest rate here, and it was different than 2008 because we didn't have the high interest rates. Right. Now we're, you know, I remember in 1990, um, two or three, I can't remember exactly, a friend of mine called me that was a realtor, and he said, You're not gonna believe this, but you can get a 10% fixed rate. 30 year loan. I said, no, nobody could do it that cheap. <laughs> and uh, so back then, you know, it's all in perspective to the, you know, what you're used to, you know, we get used to something. So now everybody's, you know, 6% is terrible. At yeah. that time, we would have thought, you know, no, there's no way. Yeah. But, uh, it's hard to compare each cycle because the variables are different, you know, and right now we're seeing, we've been through a period of inflation, which we're still in with uh, low interest rates but the rates are are going up and you know I, I don't know it's hard to there's a lot of moving parts it's kind of like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle that's spinning and you're trying to put it together you know <laughs> <laughs> makes sense yeah we're all kind of guessing right we're all kind of assuming yeah. and hoping right to see what happens yeah. um yeah you're right it's, though in certain parts of the country land is never going to decrease it's just because there is none yeah and so Nevada thank you going it. up you know it may stair step but I, I have some property that i own where my house is and it's uh it's probably i bought it in 1998 and it's probably worth um uh, maybe 10 times what it was then you know but at one point along the way it was it may have dipped even lower than you know during yeah. 2008 but it came back stronger you know so yeah. if you know it, it's hard to really it's hard for me to guess, you know. Yeah. So before we let you go, I want to remind, remind everyone that this is was recorded. It will be on YouTube. It will be on our podcast, something else. Uh, if you're not sure, go to our website. You'll find it, jkpholdings.com slash webinars. Where's the weirdest place you own land? I think you told me on the phone. Where's the weirdest block of land that you own? I think you mentioned something about Nevada. remember what it was um uh, maybe there's a weirder one than that uh I, I don't own it now but at one time i bought 40 acres of tundra in minnesota uh, i actually traded for it from a friend of mine who got it some way that lived here locally and we were always trading property and he i had something that uh, or he had something i had something he wanted and he said uh, he wanted to be an owner finance and he would give me 40 acres of land in minnesota which I took and ended up selling it back to him a few years later, but it was, was virtually worth very little, but uh, that was a weird one. Uh, I can't remember the one you were, that I told you about now. You see, it's a square mile in Arizona, Nevada, or something like that. It just, you know, Nevada is a weird state where it's, it's all sand. Like, why would you buy something? Like you're, every lot of land is owned somewhere by somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, probably because of the price, <laughs> you know, it probably was really cheap, but, uh, <laughs> I'm guessing, but um, I did, I, I will tell you one quick story if you have time. Uh, I bought, a, sure. uh, back in 2010, I bought a, a, a pool of, of uh, vacant lots from a bank, and uh, my son-in-law was working for me, and he was going to be teaching in Dallas for a uh, he's got a college. He went to work for Teach for America, where he was going to teach in the inner city for two years. And he went down to to apply for his job or to talk to the guy's job interview. And uh, I asked him if he would go by and look at this property in Alvarado. It was a vacant, supposed to be a half acre vacant lot. 
When we came back, he, you know, there was like 10 lots that we bought in this package. When we came back, he said, it's not a vacant lot, it's a double wide. And it's actually pretty darn nice. So we bought this 10 lots from the bank. And at that time they were going so fast and so crazy, they didn't really know what they had. And they right. threw in this one that had a mobile home on it that was double wide on a half acre. Anyway, they bought it for me for what I paid for it, which was twenty five hundred dollars, and I, you know because it was my daughter and son in law. Anyway, we all worked on it that summer, and then when they left two years later, they sold it for sixty thousand. Good and for them. That was kind of a, a unique situation. It wasn't really vacant land, but it was presented that way. So yeah, yeah sometimes huh. you just get lucky, you know. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, that's and awesome. See, I appreciate coming on and explaining this weird world of land notes and I see it and I avoid it, but now I'm going to start looking at them and seeing what kind of, if it's near a good street or inside of a mobile home park, um, yeah. I'd be interested to kind of dive into that. You're right. Mobile home has become such a big, 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 big part of the investment world now. Um, that yeah. It's a blank lot inside of a mobile home park. You never know what's out in, in a real area and it's an acre and it's got a septic tank and it's got water and it's power mm -hmm. it's been set up for a mobile home or it's potentially could be set up. It's got that value there. That's, you know, that uh, makes it worth a lot more than if it didn't have that potential for a mobile home to be set up. It doesn't yeah. have to be in a mobile home park. You know, it could be out in a rural area. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I appreciate the information. This has been really yeah, good. Steve, I appreciate coming on and spending some time with us on this Friday afternoon. Uh, and keep on letting us know. We'll share your information with everyone out there. If you have any questions um, inside the, the form, it, you, once you fill it out, you'll get an email automatically from our trade desk with Steve's information, phone number, and email address. If you have any questions about it, feel free to reach out to Steve. And Steve, again, I appreciate you uh, jumping on, spending an hour with us on this Friday afternoon. And uh, we hope to hear from you soon again. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Likewise. You bet. Happy Good Friday, everybody. Really good question. Yes. Have a good Easter for those who celebrate Easter. <laughs>